Hey, fellow Mathers, before we get into this episode, we want to share with you how you can get access to free content, professional learning that will keep your students engaged and doing the math that matters. Get ready to go to this link, mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. That's right. Registration is open for the free Math is Figure Outable challenge that's starting May 15th and runs to the 17th at 7 p.m. Central. We're going to have three nights jam-packed with learning and routines that you can take straight to your classroom. In these challenges, we have a great time. We do some math, talk about classroom experiences, give away super cool bonuses and prizes. You won't just walk away with routines that are naturally engaging and encourage your students to think mathematically. You'll also have a chance to win over 6 k worth in prizes, including a few virtual PD sessions for your school. I'll be joined by my wonderful co-host, Kim, and special guest, Jenna Laib. You can register at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge for a fantastic learning experience. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Now on to the show. Hey, fellow mathematicians. Welcome to the podcast where math is figure outable. I'm Pam. And I'm Kim. And you found a place where math is not about memorizing and mimicking, waiting to be told or shown what to do. But y'all, it's about making sense of problems, noticing patterns, and reasoning using mathematical relationships. We can mentor mathematicians as we co-create meaning together. Not haphazardly, we're planning for it. <laughs> it's not only are algorithms not particularly helpful in teaching mathematics, but rotely repeating steps actually keep students from being the mathematicians they can be. So today we're going to finish up our series on the fantastic mathematical model called the ratio table. We've already talked about how to use it to multiply, to divide, to solve proportions, and to add and subtract fractions. And in this episode, we're going to finish out by clarifying some important ideas and solve an extension problem. So Pam, Let's start with some clarifications. Mm -hmm. uh, Karen Camp, a fabulous, consistent participant in Math Strat Chat, said, do kids also need to erase? Yeah, totally. So in the first episode of this um, series that we've just done, I don't remember the number of it. <laughs> one of those numbers. A few, a few episodes ago. Uh, so this is the fifth one. So the first one. I should be able to do that. That's a fence post problem, Kim. I'm not <laughs> even going there. Um, so... We talked about how when you facilitate, when teachers, when you facilitate a problem string using a ratio table, we suggested that you strategically erase yeah. so that as you, uh, as the students are solving problems and you're showing that they scaled times 10. So if I scale the number of packs times 10, then I scale the number of sticks times 10. Or if I uh, divide that by, by divide those in half, then I, I would, you know, uh, I would show that scaling. Or if I add these these two numbers of packs together to get these uh, added the numbers of sticks together that when we do that, there's all this notation that happens on the board mm -hmm. during a problem string. We suggested that uh, there are strategic times for you to erase so that what remains on the board are the, the, the most, the main, uh, the most important main relationships that are happening as you go to the next problem. So that mm -hmm. when you put the next problem up, kids can don't have to see how we got the last answer they can now just focus on what relationships do we have up there that they could use to get the next one. Yeah. And Karen is asking, but don't we want students to, to like notate their work so we can follow what they were doing? And to the answer to that is absolutely. So what we, what we didn't do at all in that first episode was parse out when, when our teachers erasing and when our students erasing yeah. and Kim, this really reminds me of when I, early in our work together, when I was diving into the research and diving into my kids' classrooms and you were at my kids' campus and we were working with open number lines for the first time ever and trying to model thinking, you, you, uh, the teachers asked me, you noticed that I sometimes put arrows on open number lines and, and sometimes I put plus and minus when I, if like, if I was adding 20, uh -huh. sometimes I would write plus 20 and sometimes I would write, if I was doing a subtraction problem, I would write subtract something. And sometimes I wouldn't. And they, they yeah. were like, oh, we can't tell what's your rhyme or reason for when you would and when you wouldn't. And, and we had to kind of parse that out. But then the strongly was this suggestion of, but students should notate their work more. Like there were times where I said, ooh, but if I'm dealing with the relationship between addition and subtraction, 
let's not maybe put a plus and minus sign up there because I want students to be able to see from this number line, they could write an addition problem. They could write a subtraction problem. Like it's these relationships could represent, uh, could be, could be represented by many equations. Yeah. But as soon as we put a, a subtraction sign and the jump, oh, then it's, it's a subtraction problem. Right. Anyway, based, I know I'm kind of going off on, you're like, why are you going into addition? <laughs> yeah, that's good. My point is that, that there are times where teachers are strategic about what they yeah. notate. We want students to not worry about that. What we want students to do is notate, like yeah. mark up your work, show us your thinking as much as possible. And when they might go, oh, I did it in my head. Then we could say, oh yeah, yeah, I believe you. I believe you did it in your head. Yeah. <laughs> I can't see what's in your head. Can you show me? You know, like, can you help me? Help me see what's in your head. Help me see what's happening in your brain. Yeah. Remember, do say represent. This might be the point where a student is like, I don't know. I don't know how to show you what's in my head. Yeah. At that point, yeah. then we say, oh, well, tell me, tell me what's going on in your head. Let, here, I will, I'll, I'll help. I'll make your thinking visible this time. Next time you give it a go. Is that, you know, yeah. is this what, is it, does this show what was happening in your head? Cool, cool. All right. Now, now you've seen how to put on your, to put on paper, what was in your head, how to make visible what you're thinking next time. Next time you, you show me what's going on in your head. Cause that's, what's important, right? It's like the relationships you're using are important. And yes, Karen, we need to see what students are doing as much as possible. So we're not, I'm not asking students to erase. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad that you said that because I could hear people, the part about um, helping students, because I could hear people saying, but my kids don't know how to represent quite yet. And, and this actually came up. We had a, we had a conversation not too long ago with one of our stellar teachers in Journey, uh, the membership site. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. do you remember, she shared some work um, in the Facebook group with her students. And she was really excited because um, brilliantly, she noticed that her students were doing some great thinking with really sophisticated strategies for multiplication. Yeah. Way to go, but, Adina. Way to go. <laughs> Woo! But they didn't really represent their thinking well. So she, like, genius. She, like, moved into the space and she asked students what they were thinking about. And then she model represented for them. And, and that's how we would expect that the use of ratio tables would continue. We, we can't expect that students will see us make use of a ratio table like a few times and then automatically know how to represent all their thinking, you know, beautifully, clearly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but in time seeing their thinking on paper, it can become a tool for thinking as well. Absolutely. And, and then at, now that it's a tool for them, then mm -hmm. they're going to be more naturally notating their thinking. And uh, yeah. all of a sudden, all the thinking is happening and we're able to see it. It's they, they can make it visual um, yeah. because they're using, they're, they're actually using the ratio table as a tool. They're not just, mm -hmm. Ooh, what happened in my head here? Let me put that down. But they're actually like, I, I can't tell you the number of times that we see students now where we give them a multiplication problem and they throw down a ratio table and start mm -hmm. messing with values in that way, it's actually a tool that's that that they're using in time to think with. Yeah, that's super cool. In fact, it might be worth parsing out right now something that I, I almost wish that I had thought of to say in the first episode on ratio tables. But hey, let's let's wrap up our our series on ratio tables by making this point clear: what a ratio table is not is some funky new new math. Uh, oh, now we're going to do this different weird thing. It's, it's actually much more like this, that what we've done is interview mathy people. This is my work. I don't know. I, I don't know that I've clearly said this very well in the podcast, so I'm going to be a little bit more clear today. Part of my work is to interview mathy people and figure out how do mathematicians actually think and reason about math? What do they actually do? Because y'all, they don't use algorithms. Most of the time they, they come up with algorithms because they want to generalize relationships, but they don't actually use them when they're solving problems. So what I do is I dive into the math and I dive into people's brains and I, and I, I pull out the thinking like what's actually happening as mathy people are solving problems. And then we make that accessible to the rest of the world. Then mm -hmm. we say, Ooh, Hey, Solve that proportion to get, solve that multiplication. Those, oh, those, those relationships, they could look like this on a ratio table. Ah, that's how you mathy people have always been thinking about division. Hmm. We could make that thinking visible on a ratio table. And then the rest of us now have access to it. Yeah. So or the ratio table is one way that we are able to take what 
people have naturally done to solve math problems and and represent those relationships that they have sort of naturally been using that the rest of us didn't know existed because we were just doing the steps or over there mimicking the steps we were told to do. But what we what we weren't doing was being able to see inside their brains. Well, that's what we're, we're um, helping you with, with ratio tables. We're helping you go, oh, when sort of mathematicians, mathy people have been kind of naturally using their whatever talent to solve problems, these are the relationships they've been using and we can make them visible in a ratio table. And then we can help that to, that uh, ratio table become a tool so that you can think the same way. You can start to use the same kinds of thinking to solve multiplication problems and division problems and pr- proportions like we did in, in the third episode. And last week when we did in um, solving addition, subtraction, fractions by finding equivalent fractions, you can use ratio tables to think in those ways. And then we can all think more and more like mathematicians. Does that make sense, Kim? Did I say that? I think I'm still parsing out how to kind of say all that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I appreciate that, um, that what you do is really try to make sense of mathematics for the masses in that, that these are things that are happening. Um, and it's just sometimes hidden sometimes like trapped inside people's brains because they, they don't have the language maybe, or definitely don't have a way that was, that was it for me. Right. I, I kind of stumbled my way through trying to figure out how to even talk about it, but I didn't have any way of putting stuff on paper to make sense of it for others. And so it was just, it was just not a thing. We just didn't talk about it. We just didn't, didn't, you know, I didn't share strategies. I certainly didn't have a way of like learning more of the sophisticated strategies that I wasn't using. So, um, you know, it's good work. Yeah, super. I appreciate you saying that. Cool. So in this episode, we like to finish out by giving an example of where ratio tables can go in higher math. What do we do even after the work that we've done so far with solving proportions and and adding and subtracting fractions? Well, first of all, let's acknowledge that if we've done the work, if we can get everybody to do the work that we've talked about so far, getting kids multiplying and dividing and solving proportions, Mm -hmm. finding equivalent fractions and ratios, using ratio tables, that's a huge win because students will be thinking and reasoning proportionally. And, And getting them to think and reason proportionally is a super huge win because now we can build on that. Everything from rates, rates of change, to scaling, to fractions, ratios, to then rational functions, all are going to be based on and build on reasoning proportionally. And all of those things are going to be more of a natural outcome that we'll have more access to if we've gotten students thinking and reasoning proportionally. And one of the super good ways to do that is using a ratio table. But there's also a fun side effect that I did not anticipate. And it's super cool the more and more that I see it as more and more people are using ratio tables to build up proportional reasoning. The super fun side effect about writing the equation of a line. And we did a little bit of this in uh, an earlier episode where uh, and we're going to do it again. So this is this is super fun. Um, So (laughs) even even (laughs) Kim's laughing. Super fun. Even if this is not your content, y'all dive in. Cause I think, I think especially if you've been using ratio tables, you're going to be amazed at what's going to pop for you uh, as, as we go. So Kim, I'm going to give you um, a couple of points okay. and I'm going to ask you to consider, well, I'm going to walk you through kind of what we're going to do. So okay. here we go. If I give you the point one 14, so one comma 14, the X is one, the Y is 14 and a point two. 28. Okay. Before we get into writing the equation of a line or anything, could you picture sticks of gum? Yeah. Could you so tell, tell me about that context? Sure. So I'm going to, I actually, um, you know, cause we're talking about ratio tables. I actually ah. put that on a ratio table and I put uh, one to 14 in the first, first entry. Mm-hmm. And then I put uh two to 28 in the second. And it, it completely makes me think of one pack has 14 sticks. Two packs has, 28 sticks. Brilliant. So here's a necessary step in order to get my final thing to work is that we would need to have done sticks of gum, which, which obviously you're like, yep, clearly, clearly Mm -hmm. that's pinging for you right now. But we would also needed to have done a little bit of an extra step where we would graph those points as ordered pairs 
So over okay. one, up 14, over two, up 28. And we would have written the equation of the line that contains those points. So we would have been wanted to say, if I, if I want to find any number of sticks mm -hmm. based on the number of packs, mm -hmm. what, what equation of a line would that be? And so I, I, I what, what equation line would, would work for these two points, these two sets. Yeah. These two points. Um, so it would be 14 X. Yeah. So yeah. why, why would equal 14 X? Yeah. And, and if we stayed in six of gum, then we would say the number of sticks is equivalent to 14 times the number of packs. Yeah. So in my, I actually made a third entry and yeah. I put X in the, in the top and I put 14 X in the bottom. Oh, nice. Nice. So you can kind of see that that's the the mm -hmm. relationship. The output mm -hmm. will be 14 times the number of sticks. Mm -hmm. Cool. So listeners, we would want to get students to be able to write the equation of a proportional relation where it's, it would fit in a sticks of gum scenario um, where it includes the origin and all of the ratios are equivalent. One to 14 is equivalent to two to 28. So when I have a proportional relation, we'd want students to be able to write the equation of that line. In this case, y equals 14 X. And we would want to do that a bit so that students kind of get, have this feel for proportional relations, not, not only operating in a ratio table, but also being able to write the equation of the line that fits those points. When we do that, then I think it follows fairly naturally for me to give a set of points. I'm going to give you another set of points, Kim, and I'm going to ask you if you see any connection or if anything pings for you. So what if I give you the points 113, 1, 13. Okay. And 227. Okay. Is there anything that pings for you based on, this is a separate ratio table. I should have said that. We're not, yep. we're not adding to the first ratio table. So yep. new, new set of points. Does, does anything ping for you? As you well, know? yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like the first ratio table <laughs> because um, instead of one to 14, it's one to 13. Instead of two to 28, it's two to 27. So it's like that same 14 uh, sticks per pack, mm -hmm. but you took away a stick. So uh, 14 per pack minus one. Because there's still, there's still 14, 13 plus 14 is still 27, right? There's still 14 sticks in between the two points. Like if, mm -hmm. we, if we were to look mm -hmm. at from 13 to, to 27, it's still 14. Yep. Yep. So there's still that, that change of 14 every time, 14 mm -hmm. X. But we've subtracted one. And I will never forget the day that Ann Roman said to me, I, I just see the 1428 just popping out. It's just like sitting there. I've dealt with ratio tables so often that I just see the 1428. But it's just, it's just, just shifted just a little, just, it's just off one. Yep. So, so then what's the equation of the line for 113 and 227? 14x minus yep. one. Yeah. Yeah. So y equals 14x minus one. Let's do another one. One more, one more yeah. example. All right. So this time I'm going to give you, uh, again, two ordered pairs. Okay. The first one is one, mm -hmm. negative six. Mm, okay. Second point, two, negative 12. Okay. All right. So you know. this one is interesting to me because you could think about like sticks of gum, one to six, two to 12, but then it's negative but i also was thinking more like um one time something happened i lost six bucks and and two times it happened i lost two sixes so mm -hmm. it was like a debt or like i owed six bucks each time something happened sure enough so you so uh, nice flexibility you can kind of think of that two ways um uh, so what would be the equation of the line that would represent those um characters? y equals negative six x Cool. And I'll just focus because we've been talking about ratio tables. So I like how you did the, the six bucks things, but I'll focus on what you said first, that, that if we've got students thinking about six sticks of gum, 12, uh, 12 sticks of gum and two packs, mm -hmm. then could they write the equation of line Y equals six X and they could even picture that line, uh, sort of, um, going through the first, the first quadrant, um, and then say to themselves, but it's the opposite. Mm -hmm. I've got to reflect everything. And so now it's going to go through the second and fourth quadrant. It's so y equals to the negative six x. So just a different way. And we would want students to own both of the ways that you just thought about that. I'm so mm -hmm. super glad that you do. Cool. Then if we've got that sort of that relationship kind of pinging for kids, could we give them problem uh, points like this? 
1, negative 5, 2, 2, negative 11. Okay. So 1, negative 5, 2, negative 11. And wonder if anything pings. Yeah, so um, it's it's going to be similar to the one that you just gave me. Okay. Where it's negative 6x. But it's not quite as negative each time. <laughs> so okay. so, so like it's it. um, like one it. away. It's not quite as negative by one, so plus one. So negative 6x plus one. So y equals negative 6x plus one. Yeah. Super. Yeah, because we've just... We can see, it's almost like you can see the negative 6, negative 12, but it's not quite as negative. I like yep. it. It's been mm -hmm. shifted up one. And you can, yep. and I actually just sort of took that line that I had kind of drawn in the air and I shifted it up yep. one to get negative 6x plus one. Super cool. So what we're suggesting is that there's this natural outcome that once students really start thinking and reasoning with ratio tables that they begin to see them in places that we might not have seen them before if we hadn't already kind of owned those relationships. And if we can write the equation of a line for a proportional relation, and we can see that this non-proportional relation is just, just, just a little bit off, then we decide how far off is it? Oh, bam. Yeah. And then and write the equation of line based on just that, those, those noticings. When, when, Kim, when I say in the beginning of the podcast that we can, um, I'm trying to go back to my script here so I can say it correctly. When we notice patterns and reason using mathematical relationships, that's what I mean. That's what I mean when I say that, that it's about noticing the pattern like this ratio table. It's like letting it ping for you. Oh, but it's just off. It's just off a little bit. And so I can write the equation for that proportional. And for this non-proportional, I can just tweak the equation to match. It's, it's about yeah. noticing patterns and using relationships. Woo! Super cool. And let me just note that we also have this shift happening. And so there's also this idea of shifting. And boy, I'm just, I'm reminded of two things. I'm reminded of a geometric shift that we, uh, when we translate functions. Mm -hmm. And so that's an important kind of uh, thing that could, that we can, that comes out naturally because of this ratio table connection uh, that we can uh, use then with students as we talk about transformations of functions. There's also... I, this is like the hardest thing for me to talk about in higher math. Um, it, when we think of that shift in transformations of functions, the vertical shift is super easy, right? Yeah. Like, like if you have Y equals X squared plus one, you're like, duh, because you're taking all the Y values and you add one. And so that parabola just shifts up one. Yep. If it's Y equals X cubed minus 15, then it's, you take that X cubed function and all the Y values are just down 15. And so the easy shift, but boy, that shift in the parentheses. It's tricky, right? Yes. It's tricky. And when yes. you replace X with, with X minus five, why doesn't the parabola go to the left five? If it was yep. X minus five, you'd think subtract, it should be left. But it's not. And I tell you, Kim, when we work with, so I, I'm definitely talking to high school teachers now or high school and above. But when we work with, well, I should just say that. Anybody who's messed with functions and transformations of functions lately, that's who I'm talking to. When we mess with this proportional relation and how I, I, uh, I'm encouraging us to see the ratio table, the equivalent ratios just shifted up or down. That is the same feeling I get when I am, am finally now able to explain that horizontal shift for, yeah. for function transformations. Because for me in my head, what's happening is I'm saying to myself, I'm replacing X with X plus two. Mm -hmm. And I when I replace X with X plus two, so X plus two is in the parentheses and that, that function is going to shift to the left. What? But it's plus. Shouldn't it be to the right? It's all about me having to go in the table to where I would normally have gone the X, but I've got to go plus two. I've got to go down the table two, grab that Y value, but then it's got to shift back up the table to give it where that X was. See, I don't say that very well. Anybody who understands that shift just went, yeah, 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 that's totally right. And anybody who doesn't is like, what? <laughs> um, I I can remember when we were filming for um, Building Powerful Linear Functions, mm -hmm. I, remember, um, <laughs> I remember thinking, 
what is going on? Like <laughs> they're in this moment that you're talking about right now, I was like, you know, oh, it's it's plus one. It goes this way. It's plus. And, and I remember going, wait a second. And like really thinking about it. And then when um, my oldest Luke tackled this, I was like, wait a second. Like it took, like I had that minor experience the first time. And I was like, it was real kind of um, foggy for me. I was just trying to make sense of it. But then when, when Luke and I kind of worked through some stuff, I was like, ah, it was just one of those moments where I was like, so I'm, I'm following you right now. Like I have a clue what you're talking about because (laughs) I've had, had an experience where I had to make sense of that myself. Mm -hmm. Super cool. I love Luke. Nice. (laughs) All right. So why this model, why the ratio tamer model in summary, We can not only multiply and build multiplicative reasoning with division and and throw long division away because we can use ratio tables to think in reasons to division, but then it can extend to solving proportions. It can extend to thinking about equivalent ratios and fractions, everything to do with proportional reasoning. Mm -hmm. And we can use it as a tool for reasoning in higher math, like finding the equation of a line. We can use it to reason about rational functions. There's so many different places that it's going to help us reason proportionally and beyond uh, in mathematics. And remember, it is not a strategy. It's not when someone says, how'd you solve it? The answer isn't, I did a, I did a ratio table. The answer yeah. is, oh, I use these relationships in a ratio table. Like this is, I, I, I did... Uh, I was thinking about um, an over strategy, or I was thinking about five is half a 10, or I was scaling up. And then it's the idea of what were the relationships that we're using. Remember, the ratio table is a model. It's a super cool model because it can be used as a tool for reasoning. Yeah. Y'all, I'm super excited because we (laughs) have a challenge coming up. We are super excited. Three times a year. We run a free challenge for math teachers everywhere. Everyone's invited. We'd love for you to join us. It's going to be uh, January 18th through 20th. And I may be even more excited than you are. It is super fun. It is like a free webinar on steroids because it's not just one hour that we get together, but we get three hours or sorry. Well, it is three hours. It's three days, one hour each where we dive in. It's totally free. I teach about something very timely, something that's on my mind that I'm seeing happening as I'm working with teachers all around the world that I'm like, oh, we got to dive into this thing. This is going to be super helpful for everybody. We give you short, actionable things so you can get quick wins and really learn a ton all at once. Um, things that you can try immediately with with people right next to you and try immediately in your classrooms. And y'all, it's just a way for us to get together and do some exciting math for teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, we always have a special guest and we have, uh, have a super fun Facebook group and all the things. It's just a blast. Really, I want to invite you cordially to be part of our upcoming challenge. And you will be able to register for this coming challenge next week, January 9th, 2023. And if you're having to listen to this episode after that date, you can always check mathisfigureoutable.com slash change to see when our next challenge will be coming up. We would love to have you join us. And thanks for joining us today on the pa- on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in and teaching more and more real math. To find out more about the Math is Figure Outable movement, visit mathisfigureoutable.com. Let's keep spreading the word that math is figure outable. Thank you for listening and making math more figure outable. To learn even more, make sure you register for our free challenge at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. You are not going to want to miss the evenings of May 15th through 17th, starting at 7 p.m. Central. Math teaching, math teaching, go register now. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Join us to make math more and more figure outable. And if you can't join live, register and we'll send you access to the recordings. We'll see you there.